Thanks for joining us. I'm Kelly Yoon. All right, Toronto sports fans, there is a lot to cheer about today. The city is getting a WNBA team, the first in Canada. CBC Sports broke the news earlier today. Sources telling us that MLSE minority owner Larry Tannenbaum is being awarded the expansion team with an official announcement expected later this month. Dale Manukduk has the details. To the fans calling for a WNBA team in Toronto, the league has answered. She the North is finally happening. CBC Sports has learned that Toronto will get its own professional women's basketball team. They'll tip off for the 2026 season. I think women are amazing and I'm so excited to go watch my first WNBA game. For girls, having those role models out there is, is going to be a big, big positive. I used to play ball in high school and I think women has a shot of being, doing anything that man can do. So I think it's an amazing deal. So bring it on. According to CBC Sports senior reporter Shereen Ahmed, who broke the story, billionaire Larry Tannenbaum's Kilmer Group won the bid. Tannenbaum had previously pitched the idea of a WNBA team to MLSE, where he's a minority owner, but was turned down. Ahmed says the new team will play at Coca-Cola Coliseum. It has been confirmed and any potential conflict with FIFA 2026, because Toronto is a co-host mm -hmm. city, are, have all been resolved. So that looks like it's gone through as well. Canada does a terrific job hosting the WNBA. The WNBA has some proof of concept that Canadian appetite is strong. Last year, the league sold out Scotiabank Arena for its first ever game played north of the border. And just last week, reached capacity in Edmonton for a preseason affair. I didn't think it was something that was going to come to life so quickly. And uh, for the young girl in me, just knowing that girls and boys growing up in Canada will have firsthand a team in Toronto and Canada's team uh, will be so exciting. Last season, the W announced it's expanding into Golden State. That team will debut in 2025. Toronto will be the league's 14th team. You know, it's expensive to get a new team. And when you think about a new country, you think about customs, um, you think about traveling, you know, to and from visas, all that stuff. And the WNBA literally yesterday just announced a chartered flight program. So that was a huge barrier. Women's sports in Toronto has been blowing up. The city's PWHL team sold out their regular season and playoff games. I think Toronto's proven time and time again that um, they love our sports here. And so um, with the WNBA, I was at the game last year and it was absolutely electric the entire week leading up to the game. So I couldn't be excited to, couldn't be more excited to have uh, the chance to witness women's professional basketball and have them join us here as uh, professional women's sports. Major moves for the W. Meanwhile, women's basketball is seeing its own boom, gaining mainstream attention from the biggest names in sports. It just cements what greatness is supposed to be. It's largely driven by American star Caitlin Clark, who just this week helped sell out a preseason game in Indiana. More than 13,000 people attended, nearly triple last year's regular season crowd. Tickets are in the thousands of dollars to go watch her play against the Liberty. It's crazy. So I think it's huge because so many people who might not have watched basketball in general, not even just women's basketball, might not have watched basketball in general, Heard the Caitlin Clark hype, they watched her in college, they watched the WNBA draft, they want to watch her career. Tannenbaum's Kilmer Group and the WNBA have not confirmed the Toronto deal. A formal announcement is expected on May 23rd. Dale Minuckduck, CBC News, Toronto. After another disappointing finish to their season, Maple Leafs management faced some tough questions today at their annual year-end press conference. They're also going to be facing some difficult decisions this offseason as they try to fix what hasn't been working. And that could mean moving out some big-name talent. Greg Ross explains. Good morning, everybody. Maple Leafs president Brendan Shanahan and general manager Brad Tree Living were joined at the year-end press conference by new MLSE CEO Keith Pelley. He says his directive for this team is clear. We need to win. Nothing else matters. And Pelly will continue banking on Shanahan to make that happen. He's keeping his job despite another disappointing playoff performance this year. And the fact that the Leafs have only won a single playoff series in Shanahan's 10 years here. Brendan Shanahan is the president of the Toronto Maple Leafs. He's a champion. He's a three-time Stanley Cup winner. Uh, what, I, what I saw in my four weeks with the two gentlemen beside me showed me that the chemistry and unity is being built at the highest levels. Uh, Shanahan fired Coach Sheldon Keefe yesterday. Uh, 
but he says Keefe does not deserve the blame for the team's woes. The reality of the situation is the ultimate responsibility is on me. The accountability is on me. Um, our playoff results have not been good enough. That's on me. Corner knocked out, chance, scores! Austin Matthews, After eight years of putting their faith in core players Austin Matthews, Mitch Marner, John Tavares, and William Nylander, the Leafs are now considering big changes this offseason. Those are really good players. Um, we've got to find a dig into why this, why we're ending up with the same result year after year after year and, 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 and adjust accordingly. When you see patterns persist and the results don't change, you have to adjust the way that you think about things. Both Matthews and Nylander recently signed lengthy contract extensions leaving Marner and Tavares as the most likely candidates to be traded. This could prove to be difficult, though, because both have no movement clauses in their contracts. I don't think it serves the Toronto Maple Leafs in any fashion to discuss those things prematurely, uh, to discuss those individuals prematurely. Uh, our focus right now is on finding a new head coach, and certainly that new head coach will have an important voice as part of our decisions going forward. Today, Pelly said that he came to this organization to win. He says good is not good enough. And moving forward, he says no decision will be made without detailed analysis that gives the Leafs their best chance to win. Greg Ross, CBC News, Toronto. The Leafs playoff run may be over, but PWHL Toronto is just getting started. The team shut out Minnesota 4-0 on Wednesday in the first ever playoff game in the Professional Women's Hockey League. Forward Sarah Nurse says she's feeling confident about tonight's game too. We broke the puck out excellently the other game. Uh, we forechecked great. Our transition game was great. And so continuing to build little pieces like that, little tweaks here and there, but I don't think we're going to have huge changes for sure. The club had an optional skate this morning at Coca-Cola Coliseum. That's where they'll be hosting Minnesota in front of an anticipated 8,500 fans. A win would give Toronto a 2-0 lead in the best of five semifinal series. In game one, Natalie Spooner opened up the scoring with Blair Turnbull putting in two for Toronto. And goalie Kirsten Campbell posting a 25-save shutout. The puck drops tonight at 7. And a reminder for news anytime, you can head to our website, that's at cbc.ca slash Toronto, or download the CBC News app. Lawyers gave their closing arguments today in a high-profile Toronto police tribunal involving the first black woman to rise to the rank of superintendent. Stacey Clark pleaded guilty last year to seven charges, including insubordination, after providing confidential information to officers to help them in their promotion interviews. Lane Harrison has the latest. The final day of Superintendent Stacy Clark's police punishment hearing centered around the terms of her potential demotion. The groundbreaking officer pleaded guilty to interfering in the force's promotional process, but argued it was a desperate attempt to diversify leadership in the face of systemic racism. The police's prosecutor argued Clark should be demoted and forced to reapply for superintendent, but Clark's defense lawyer Joseph Markson argued that would be too harsh, and said other senior officers found guilty of things like drunk drugs driving had been given automatic reinstatements. Markson argued Clark's guilt in the tribunal would hamper her chances in the competition to move up the ranks. He told the hearing, quote, the requirement that Superintendent Clark engage in the promotional process for the rank of superintendent is effectively a permanent demotion to inspector. Now, we can imagine a world where that would not be the case. That world is remote. Police prosecutor Scott Hutchison said if that's the case, it puts more strength behind his argument that she should have to reapply. Clark pled guilty to sharing confidential interview questions and answers with candidates. In his closing arguments, Hutchison asked the presiding deputy to imagine a world where she was successful, saying, quote, we would have six sergeants who believed that this kind of behavior was not simply acceptable or tolerable, but in fact, it was the kind of behavior engaged in by superstars. The police auditorium has been filled with Clark supporters all week. Among those present today was Roy Williams, the first black person to serve on a Toronto police board. This system is, ar is an archaic system. We know that people with the color of this skin has always had problems. We fight 
to get equity ever since slavery. And people have died in the process. The sentence that Superintendent Clark is going to get, doesn't matter how minimal it is, will be a severe penalty and she will pay a large price. Retired Superintendent David McLeod was also at the hearing. Going forward, he says the force needs to do better. There's got to be a way to bring the management of the organization, the police services board, in line with the notion that equality isn't just a policy or a procedure in a book. Community leaders have been telling us all week that if Clark is punished harshly, it would damage the relationship between the black community and Toronto police, with some even suggesting today that the city could see protests as a result. Now, the deputy overseeing the case said today that a decision on Clark's punishment won't come until midsummer at the earliest. Lane Harrison, CBC News, Toronto. Small business owners are on high alert after a string of break-ins in the East End. Over the past few weeks, several businesses have dealt with smashed windows and thefts. As Tally Ricci reports, police say they're seeing more incidents like this recently. Security video shows a window being smashed at Farside, a bar on Girard. And just up the street, a similar incident on the same night at Coffee and Clothing. It was actually the local community that told us about it. Somebody was walking by, saw somebody throw a brick through our window. Five to ten items of clothing were stolen as well. There was also a break-in and theft at Eastside Social on Queen East last weekend. Police say a male, average height, approximately 35 to 45 years old, bald with glasses, was sitting at a restaurant bar but later hid in the basement until staff left. He then deactivated the alarm system and broke into the business safe. Since COVID, it's happened quite a, like way more often. Um, and I think just people are desperate, but I think it's definitely happening more this year. It's happening, you know, you hear about a new one once a week or so. Police say they're able to offer visits to local businesses to help them make their locations more secure. Police say they've also noted an increase in break and enters right across the city. Well, the Toronto Police Service is concerned. We have seen year to date a 16.6% increase in break and enters across the city. And when you look at 2023 compared to 2022, we see about a 25% increase. So we do see that particular crime trend on the rise in our cities. Those businesses on Girard that had their windows broken, they're just tiny little businesses living on a shoestring. So it is crippling when those things happen. And I will hope that the police are able to go and give them some assistance. Let's nip this in the bud early in the season. The owners at Coffee and Clothing have repaired their door and are thankful the neighborhood was watching out for them. It made more of a presence of like just community members watching out for each other and just talking to each other more. But also I think it comes down to the city and like doing stuff more for the people that need it so they don't have to rely on like, breaking into small businesses. Talia Ricci, CBC News, Toronto. The Transportation Safety Board is confirming a freight train derailment at Agent Court Yard in Scarborough. The TSB says a remote control train was switching cars when it sideswiped another train. As a result, one car on the remote control train was derailed on its side and four cars on the other train were derailed upright. An unknown amount of poultry fat leaked from one of the cars. No injuries were reported. Toronto Fire Chief Matthew Pegg is hanging up his chief's hat. He's retiring after more than three decades as a firefighter. Pegg has been a voice of calm on many fire scenes over the years and an advocate for mental health. Lorena Redekop spoke with the chief today and has more. I started as a volunteer firefighter in uh, Keswick. Is, uh, at 18 years old. He's been a firefighter his entire adult life. Now at the age of 50, Chief Matthew Pegg has decided it's time to retire. It just made sense. It's like I'm, you know, I'm so privileged to be, to have served 32 years in the fire service and be standing here today emotionally, mentally and physically healthy. He's been on the scene of the city's biggest fires, leading Toronto's fire service since 2016, having to deliver some tough news. Unfortunately, uh, we have received confirmation that that, that that occupant has been pronounced dead. And tough messages. This is the right time right now to go and test your smoke alarms. He says it was important to him, as leader of the fire service, to go to those scenes. To do my very best to be the face and voice of calm against a backdrop of 
fear and a backdrop of emergency and a backdrop of uncertainty to say to the three million people in Toronto when those things happen, we got this and it's going to be okay. He has lots of memories of some of the major fires he's been to. The biggest, Valentine's Day 2017 at Young and St. Clair. Part of Young Street had to be shut down. I'll never forget the six alarm badminton and racket club fire at Young and St. Clair. Uh, I was actually the interim fire chief when that happened and uh, that incident was, that's the largest deployment of our resources to a single incident in our history. He says he also won't forget some of the more difficult scenes he and his staff have encountered, including serious injuries and deaths. In early 2020, Chief Pegg went public with a personal message about mental health. I have a psychologist. Going on social media to talk about his mental health check-ins in an attempt to remove the stigma. I think it would be irresponsible not to use the platform that I've been blessed to have to try and make a little bit of a difference. Just a few months later, something that challenged mental health for a lot of people, the pandemic hit. Pig became part of the daily city briefings. And to move about the neighbourhood while maintaining increased physical distancing. He says it meant 18 to 20 hour days, more than 150 nights away from his family. I got, I had the privilege of watching this orchestra happen and that solutions were being created out of nothing. And that, that is the fastest moving incident that I have ever seen. I have been, to, I've been the incident commander at emergencies that change very quickly, nothing like COVID. As for what comes next? I'm young, I've got a ton of energy, I've got a ton of interests. Uh, I, I don't know, I have, I'm not leaving for something else. Uh, there, I have no doubt that there will be career 2.0. And after October 4th, his official retirement date, for the first time in decades, he'll be able to turn off his phone ringer at night. Lorenda Redekop, CBC News, Toronto. Controversy is greeting a new Apple advertisement. It's for an iPad, but it's touched a nerve around the question of technology versus art. Anis Haidari reports. Maybe Apple wanted to show the new iPad crushing it, replacing everything artistic with the thin device. Eye popping for some. I watched it and I had like this visceral gross reaction to literally destroy art to say we're better that is not appealing to artists i don't know who they thought they were appealing to but it was not artists and celebrities saying the same thing actress justine bateman tweeting tech and ai means to destroy the arts and hugh grant comparing the ad to the destruction of the human experience but Apple may not be targeting established artists. Who we don't see complaining are people who are getting access to this level of joy and creativity for the first time with some of these tools. So you could really make the argument maybe that Apple is just going after a new generation. Branding experts say Apple may not be hurt by a backlash. You don't need brands to love you. You just need people to be aware of you and remember of you uh, and think of you when they're at the point of choosing to buy something. The difference is striking. And with no big innovations this time around, Apple may welcome any attention. Really, we're all still talking about the introduc introduction of a slightly smaller iPad. So despite the controversy, it's working and it's working really, really well. But after days of backlash on social media, an apology from Apple saying it missed the mark on this video. And he said, Ari, CBC News, Calgary. So Colette, something pretty cool is happening this weekend. More people may be able to see the Northern Lights thanks to something that's called a solar storm. That's exactly what is happening. Very cool. Yes, it is very cool. So we're going to kind of start off with your space weather, and then we'll come down to Earth and uh, get your weather forecast for the weekend, including for Mother's Day. But what's happened is, is NOAA has issued a G4 geomagnetic storm watch. 
essentially like a space storm. And the G4, it's, it's a scale that goes to five. And so this is pretty strong, severe. They label it. The next one is extreme. I, I want to just take you back and we'll just very quickly go over the northern lights and what happens here. We're going to call it the solar winds, but the particles that come from the sun and then they interact with the atoms in Earth's upper atmosphere, the thermosphere, okay? And then we get this magnetic interaction and it tends to be at our magnetic poles where you can see them at the bright lights that come from these interactions, right? But because there's so much activity, we do have the chance tonight, even tomorrow night, uh, but our weather's a little bit better for tonight to see the, these a little further south. So the best likelihood are the reds. And that is all the way into southern BC across the, the southern prairies, I mean, into the northern plains. And it comes into parts of northern Ontario, but even green is a decent chance. And that extends to Toronto through southwestern Ontario. In fact, this red line is the potential view line. So it really sinks uh, into the belly of the US. Now, the next thing, let's bring you down to Earth and get your Earth forecast. We have to deal with our clouds too, some of our lower atmospheres. Well, we know we've had some today, some isolated showers as well, but we are getting into a clearing pattern. So improvement for the viewing, although they would be available to see from about 11 till two, I would think it's gonna be a little bit closer perhaps to midnight uh, and after midnight, especially if you get away from the lights of the city, but there's a chance in the city till about 3 or 4 a.m., okay? So you're going to have to stay up late. You're going to need a coffee, uh, but that's going to be our best shot through the overnight. Uh, tomorrow morning, we will have some dry conditions in there, and then some wet weather does move through into tomorrow afternoon. So yes, uh, do expect things to get a little bit wet on us again. And into Sunday for Mother's Day, we're going to start off pretty nice, then some cloud builds into the afternoon, an isolated shower in the evening. It's generally going to be a nice day, so I wouldn't worry too much about it. And not only that, I can tell you that instead of highs that are in the mid-teens, we're going to be talking about temperatures going to the upper teens by the time we get to Sunday for mom. It gets warmer after that too, by the way. <laughs> And I stay up pretty late, so I'm going to try to catch those lights. That's really cool. There you go. I've yeah. never seen them, so I'm hoping to. <laughs> Thanks so much, Colette. You're welcome. The UN General Assembly has voted to back a Palestinian bid to become a full member. It's a highly symbolic move since any membership application must be approved by the Security Council, but it does grant Palestinian territories new rights and privileges. Richard Madden has this story. Chaos and panic in Rafa. Tens of thousands of civilians forced to flee their homes after new warnings by Israel's military of an imminent push further into the Gaza Strip. Israel believes Rafah is the last major Hamas stronghold, but the UN warns the growing violence and mass displacement is at a crisis point. A massive ground attack in Rafah would lead to an epic humanitarian disaster and pull the plug on our efforts to support people as famine looms. Will all delegations confirm... As the war intensifies, the UN General Assembly passed a symbolic vote to give full membership to an independent Palestinian state. Canada was among the nations to abstain, while the US and Israel voted against. You are shredding the UN Charter with your own hands. Shame on you. The resolution now goes to the UN Security Council, where the US is expected to veto it, as it only supports a two-state solution agreed upon by both sides. If they go into Rafah, I'm not supplying the weapons. All this comes as US President Joe Biden defends his threats to withhold sending weapons to Israel if it follows through on a full-scale assault in Rafah. Israel's Prime Minister thinks the US is making a mistake. If Israel has to stand alone, we'll stand alone. I've known Joe Biden for many years, so 40 years and more. Uh, you know, we often had our agreements, but we've had uh, our disagreements. President Biden is facing growing divisions in his own party over his support for Israel, and his evolving stance could not only affect his support with voters in his re-election bid, it could also impact delicate negotiations to secure a ceasefire. Richard Madden, CBC News, Washington. An Israeli singer is set to compete in the final round of the Eurovision Song Contest tomorrow. But until then, Eden Golan is basically confined to her room in Sweden because of ongoing protests against Israel. Anna Cunningham has the details. 
Well, this year's Eurovision Song Contest actually has the slogan United by Music, but just a day before the final, it certainly seems that politics has very much seeped in, despite the organisers insisting that this event is never political. It's Israel's entry this year that's causing the controversy seven months into the country's war with Hamas in Gaza. And it's now become the focus of really large-scale pro-Palestinian demonstrations in Malmo. Sweden, of course, have been hoping to celebrate 50 years since ABBA actually won Eurovision, but instead they've now been forced to draft in extra police from neighbouring countries, including Denmark and Norway, ahead of tomorrow's final. And the protesters' message calling for a boycott of Eurovision is being supported elsewhere. We're hearing about watch events at clubs and pubs across the UK that had sold thousands of tickets. Well, they are now being cancelled. Eden Golan is the Israeli singer, and she was booed at rehearsals in Malmo. But during that semi-final yesterday, there was quite a mix of cheers as well as some boos that were heard at the venue. The European Broadcasting Union had, in fact, already asked Israel to change its lyrics because their song did reference directly the October 7th attacks by Hamas. The final takes place in Malmo Saturday night. And for now, Israel has jumped up the leaderboard to become one of the favourites to actually win the song contest. Anna Cunningham for CBC News, London. The U.S. has announced an additional $400 million in weapons and equipment for Ukraine. It comes after Ukrainian forces said they repelled a Russian ground attack near the northeastern city of Kharkiv. As Breyer Stewart reports, there is speculation Moscow is planning a summer offensive in the region. As the sun was rising, Russia's latest drone attack on the Kharkiv region. <laughs> At least three homes caught fire and dozens of others were damaged. Around the same time, Ukraine says Russia launched a ground offensive towards Vovchensk, a city less than five kilometers from the border. The military started to evacuate the few thousand people still living there. Tamaz Gambarashvili is in Vovchensk and spoke to CBC News despite a shaky cell phone signal and the ongoing explosions. He said while people were used to shelling, they were, quote, not ready to wake up to such a massive attack. Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky, who was meeting with the President of Slovakia, said the country's military was prepared. But he said it's important to understand that Russia can increase and bring more forces in this direction. Officials had been expecting Russia to launch an offensive in the region, which is home to Ukraine's second largest city, Kharkiv. Russia failed to capture the city in the early days of its invasion, and since then Ukraine has built up its defenses, making it a much harder target. <laughs> there can be no what-ifs. They will not break through, said this woman. No, I will not go anywhere, says this man. I will be in Kharkiv till the end. While Russia's military might not be able to seize large areas, the offensive could further stretch Ukraine's resources. Uh, to thin the Ukrainian defenses in Donbas and to make resource management when it comes to the new supplies that are coming in from the U.S. more difficult. Ukraine says it has sent reinforcements to the Kharkiv region and it's preparing for a counteroffensive in the east, which it expects Russia to launch in the coming weeks. Briar Stewart, CBC News, London. Proceedings in New York have adjourned for the week at Donald Trump's hush money trial. The former U.S. president had hoped not to have to attend court today, but a judge yesterday rejected a second request by the former president's legal team to declare a mistrial. His lawyers objected to some of the claims made during the two days of testimony by adult film star Stormy Daniels. Chris Glover has more. We now know Donald Trump's former attorney, Michael Cohen, is expected to take the stand on Monday. And Cohen is at the heart of the prosecution's case as the one who paid adult film actress Stormy Daniels the hush money to keep her quiet. Cohen, though, is a problematic witness for the prosecution, whose credibility has been called into question since he's already pleaded guilty to charges, including lying to Congress. So a lot of this case is about the prosecution using other witnesses to corroborate his 
his story, including today, a former Trump aide testified about a meeting she arranged in the Oval Office between Trump and Cohen. And that is the meeting where Cohen claims the pair hatched the plan for the reimbursement of the payments to Stormy, Stormy Daniels. But legal analyst Jessica Roth says the prosecution still has a big hole to fill. What is less clear at this point um, is whether or not Trump himself was personally involved in the falsification scheme, and that's critical for establishing the charges in this indictment. Michael Cohen's testimony will be critical in this regard, and the jury has heard evidence from other witnesses. So everything in this trial has really been leading up to Cohen's testimony. Now we know that's expected to start on Monday, likely will last a series of days. Now, as Trump was heading into court today, he was asked if he would be testifying. He did not answer that, but he did take the moment to rail against the judge, again, calling him crooked and the gag order unconstitutional. And then a bit of a bizarre show, hastily reading news articles about the trial, careful to circumvent the gag order and avoid the judge's threats of jail. She says, not going well for the prosecution. Highly respected young lady, not going well for the prosecution. But again, when you have a rigged judge, bad things can happen. Very bad things can happen. Uh, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to edit this very quickly in front of you because if I mention the wrong word, they'll come out here and they'll take me out to a jail someplace, because that's the way it is with this judge. Trump also complaining the trial is keeping him off the campaign trail, yet on his days off, he hasn't been doing much campaigning. This past Wednesday when he was off, hosting a private event for supporters at his home in Florida, and then this upcoming weekend, he only has a campaign event in New Jersey. But the lack of campaigning doesn't seem to be hurting him all that much. Most polling down here shows that he is leading over Joe Biden, especially in swing states. Chris Glover, CBC News, Washington. Journalist and commentator Rex Murphy is being remembered today. Murphy passed away yesterday at the age of 77. His long career included decades at the CBC. Peter Cowan looks back at Murphy's career, impact, and love of language. Separatism in 2014 is a ploy looking for a justification. His news commentaries were must-watch television for many, first locally in Newfoundland and Labrador, and then on the national. His unique use of language made people take note. Deborah Collins was a colleague and a friend. Rex could skewer someone in his commentary and make them smile at while he did it. You know, because he had the ability to, um, he had such wit. He was a Rhodes Scholar. He ran for political office three times and lost, before deciding his strength was in critiquing the upper echelons of power rather than joining them, always with panache. I've always considered that style was more important than substance. If you're sloppy, slangy, vulgar, blasphemous, or scatological, or simply crude and ignorant, then your thoughts are the same. For the national, I'm sex, I mean, uh, wax, muffin. But his verbose use of language also made him a target for parody. Comedian Mark Critch impersonated Murphy on this hour's 22 Minutes. He says Murphy's work was the ultimate rebuttal to the negative stereotypes of Newfoundlanders. As Newfoundlanders, uh, having someone like Rex on the national scene, he totally uh, disproved that notion. Uh, and he was the greatest wordsmith in a place known for talkers. The greatest Canadian. He would have declined the question. We're living the answer. The man who once argued Pierre Trudeau was the greatest Canadian was not a fan of Justin Trudeau. In the last few years, Murphy generated controversy when he embraced the Freedom Convoy and argued against COVID vaccine mandates, climate change and political correctness. Peter Mansbridge says Murphy felt comfortable when expressing opinions that went against the grain. It was almost easy for Rex to take those positions, uh, but he meant it, he felt it. Uh, he was, you know, he became much more right of center. I now invite honorable members to rise. A final tribute the day after his death. The politicians Murphy spent his career pillaring with his perspicacity paused to remember him. Rex Murphy was 77 years old. Peter Cowan, CBC News, St. John's. 
A South Korean company is a new world record holder when it comes to using drones in light shows. Now here is them um, showing off why they hold the Guinness World Record for using the most number of drones in a single light show. The drones are used to form massive aerial shapes of pretty much anything, like these butterflies in the night sky. And how about a giant drone made out of hundreds of little drones. Earlier this month, the company broke the previous world record by using nearly 5,300 drones at a single event. And Colette, that is pretty dazzling. Maybe mm -hmm. not as dazzling as the light show headed our way this weekend, but yeah, still pretty cool. Yeah, we have a pretty fantastic uh, chance at a light show, Mother Nature's own version uh, of one of the Northern Lights. We have some images to show you, just as a reminder of what these look like when you have that opportunity. I have never been so blessed, so I'm hoping uh, tonight to have a chance to take a look at these. And why do we think we might see them as far south as Toronto and even beyond, actually, is because NOAA has issued a G4, which is actually a severe geomagnetic storm watch, so a lot of activity in the atmosphere. And with that, the chance of it sinking, a good chance, far south, even into the northern plains, so well through uh, most of Western and Central Canada, but also uh, right through the GTA and even into Southwestern Ontario. And in fact, the view line, that may, may be a little more on the horizon, uh, it sinks even farther south from there. Weather-wise, we need the skies to part with the cloud cover too. And we're looking pretty good for that, especially as we get closer to midnight and just after to the early morning hours to about 2 or 3 a.m. We do have this next system that we're going to need to contend with coming in for the weekend, uh, but we're getting some of those isolated showers kind of drying up on us and some of the clouds dissipating. Now, a few areas could have a little bit of patchy fog, but otherwise I do anticipate clear enough skies to be able to see things. You got to get away from some of the lights of the city, though. It it does help, although maybe even right in Toronto, you'll be able to see them if they're strong enough. So the next player comes in Saturday. We should be dry tomorrow morning. And then into the afternoon, we'll get into some wet weather, some scattered showers, a better chance a little bit for the rest of us for some isolated thunderstorms in there. And for Mother's Day, we should have plenty of sunshine, kind of a mix of sun and cloud. And then late day, we'll get some clouds coming back and an isolated shower in there. Our current temperature is very close to the daytime highs today in the mid-teens. Um, Tomorrow will be similar, but what's great is that for Mother's Day, we're going to find that temperature getting back up to seasonal. Looking good there. We like that. Thanks so much, Colette. You're welcome. And that is our show for you tonight. Thanks for joining us. There will be no 11 o'clock newscast tonight because of NHL playoffs. Shannon Martin has your next local newscast tomorrow at 6. Have a great weekend, everyone.